notice that Brother Philip is not here. He had his fourth chemo treatment yesterday, and he's not here. For Philip Howell not to be here, that means he is extremely sick. So y'all continue to pray for him. He has been here after having a surgery where they ripped him in his torso from the top to the bottom. He's been here sore. We've had to put him in recliners. He's been here after three other uh, chemotherapy treatments, but him not being here tonight is indicative of he is in need of prayer. Brother Gabriel and Sister Candace are unable to be here tonight due to something that has come up with a contractor at their house. And so we miss them tonight, don't we? As far as I know, no one else is missing tonight, but we're glad you're in the house of the Lord. It's good to have our newest church member, Brother Ezra Wayne Howell, delivered by his daddy. His daddy and mama brought forth that life in the Alva Handy Store parking lot. I can't wait to hear that conversation. Where was I born, daddy? <laughs> well, son, let me tell you. But if you look at his birth certificate, the attending physician is none other than Jeremiah Ezekiel Howell, first responder. He was the first one there. He witnessed it. Isn't that great? I don't believe he wants to start a labor and delivery service, though, after talking to him. He doesn't have any desire to be a mid-husband and a mid-wife. And I don't think Sister Leah wants to repeat that, but... Uh, the traffic here in this part of the country of late has been horrific. And, uh, God just knew what they needed. I'm glad that Ezra survived the ordeal. I'm glad that Brother Jeremiah and Sister Leah survived the ordeal. Sister Cheryl said he looked mighty good, all things considered. Knowing these two and the way they are natured, they held up very well. Very well, and I appreciate that. Again, the cord was wrapped around the neck three times, but the Lord was mindful. And perhaps the Lord knew the baby couldn't wait. I believe the Lord knew that the baby going through the birth canal just couldn't take too long. And so God is in control. We've been turning in those prayer requests for Sister Cheryl, Brother Philip, Sister Donna, and the list goes on and on and on, but we never turned one in for Brother Ezra. We turned one in for Brother Simon, but God knew that Brother Ezra was in a pinch, literally, and God brought him forth. And I thank God for what he's done for every one of us this week. Aren't you glad to be Pentecostal? Does it make you nervous sometimes? I want everybody to take a deep breath. Okay, breathe out. Inhale again. Exhale. We're all feeling better. You have nothing to be nervous about tonight. I hope the message doesn't make you nervous at all. But the Holy Ghost will make saint and sinner alike nervous sometimes because that's his office is to refine us. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to St. Mark's Gospel? May I direct your attention to the 8th chapter. We will be reading verses number 14 through 21. Our golden text will be the 21st verse of St. Mark's Gospel in the 8th chapter. Brother Nathaniel, you will be reading Acts chapter number 15 and verse number 39. Brother Jesse, you will be reading Philippians chapter number 3, verses number 7 through 11. And that's Sister Pam Matulia right there. Good to see you, Sister Pam. The congregation is growing so much now I can't see everybody that's out there because of all of the heads. And I've got good news concerning our building program. The architect is working on the drawings and things are looking really good. Praise the Lord. Something to be excited about. Amen. Brother Nathaniel Acts chapter number 15 and verse number 39. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Wow, isn't that sad? So Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Brother Jesse, Philippians chapter number 3, verses number 7 through 11. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yet doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, 
and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made comfortable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So for those of you that are in this building that are familiar with the Bible and the Bible character, the Apostle Paul, you will know that he had extreme potential within the religion of Judaism. And they had promoted him. He had schooled at the feet of Gamaliel. He's one of the most powerful preachers this world has ever known. I did not say that he is the only preacher this world has ever known. I appreciate all of these preacher brethren. Every one of them have been preaching wonderfully. They're great preachers. Every one of them are anointed. The apostle Paul, though him like John the Baptist and those apostolic brethren, not talking about oneness brethren, but apostolic brethren of the early church, namely Peter, Paul, John, James, all of those fellows were Pentecostal powerhouses and great preachers. Apostle Paul could have stumbled along life's way and missed out on who God intended for him to be. Because of his situation and his circumstances and his position within Judaism, within that religion, the way he had climbed that religious ladder and became who he became, and who he would have become later on, he could have missed being the great Apostle Paul. I want to preach to you a message titled, Don't Miss the Point. Don't Miss the Point. Apostle Paul realized that there are some things that he had put great value in that he should no longer value and that there were things that he used to not value that he now valued. Things that he once loved, he now hated. Things that he once hated, he now loved. And I feel like the Holy Ghost spoke into my heart yesterday that there's some young people in this building that are missing the point. Don't miss the point. Now, all of you elders, those of you from the age of 35 and up, you get my back now. Y'all just take the reins and get that whip and just whip me with an amen. Preach it, Pastor. Don't back up. Just plow. Don't miss the point. Brother Nathaniel's life was forever changed after a message I preached titled, Don't Miss the Glory. I will be following a mental outline as I preach tonight, and I hope not to mention this outline anymore, but I feel it important tonight to do this because... Of what I'm preaching on. They missed the point. And so I'm putting a special emphasis before we get started on don't miss the point. Our point number one will be don't miss the point. Our point number two will be don't miss the power. May we stand for the reading of the word of God. St. Matthew's gospel chapter number eight verses number 14 through 21. The Bible says now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, Why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? <laughs> Having eyes, see ye not. Having ears, hear ye not. And do ye not remember when I break the five loaves among five thousand? How many basket full of fragments took ye up? They said unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? Our golden text will be that verse number 21. And he said unto them, how is it that ye do not understand? I need a praying church. Will you pray with us right now? Amen. Heavenly Father, we love and we praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. 
I pray that you would anoint this thy servant, set a guard at my mouth. Help me to say those things that you would have me to say, nothing more or less. Anoint the ears of this thy people, that they might hear what it is the Spirit saith unto the churches this night. Lord, this precious church family, this local assembly, this congregation, this gathering of believers, Lord, nearly 65 in the building. We miss those that are not here. I pray that you would make an opportunity for them to be able to hear what the Spirit is saying unto this church, Lord, here tonight in that age bracket, age 30 and below. I pray, God, that you would help us to get these sayings below the shoulders. Let them be in our hearts and our spirits. And may we depart this place joyfully and not sorrowfully. In Jesus' name, and the church says, Amen. As you're being seated, look at your neighbor and say, Hey, neighbor, don't miss the point. Reading our text again, our golden text, Mark chapter number 8, verse number 21. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? Young people, how is it that after all of these years of your parents bringing you to the house of God, how is it that ye yet do not understand? Our text is found in a New Testament book of the Holy Bible, the book of Mark. The title bears the name of its author. Most of the Bible readers and students among us tonight are quite familiar with the author of this gospel. If you are familiar at all with the author of this gospel, would you raise your hand and show us that you are familiar with the author of this gospel? What is his name? Mark, also known as John Mark. John Mark is not a stranger to those in this building who study sacred scripture. John Mark's mother was a great friend to the leaders and the members of the early New Testament church. His mother's credibility and influence within the upstart religion of Christianity enabled little John to run with the likes of Peter and Paul. I am most appreciative tonight for the influence of our pastor, our preachers, our teachers, and our elders in this congregation. You do not realize how blessed you are to have people of this capacity and caliper in your midst in such a time as this. Do not take it for granted and do not take advantage of it. And so his mother's credibility and influence within the upstart religion of Christianity enabled John Mark to run with some powerhouse men, some men that were full of the spirit of God, men that were endued with the Holy Ghost. And I believe it was last Wednesday night I preached on the great power that the early church had. And also with that great power, they had great grace. And so John Mark was no stranger to running with people that had great power and great grace in their life. And I feel like here tonight we have some wonderful saints of God and we're privileged to be sitting on the pew with some Pentecostal powerhouses. I am not pinning roses on myself, and I do not speak of myself, but I am privileged tonight to be in the company of some great prayer warriors and praise worshipers. And I know that I'm going to miss them when they are gone. Young people, there is no doubt that John Mark missed his mother after that she had went on to be with the Lord because the Bible said to be absent in body is to be present with the Lord. And we know that John Mark's mother had no greater joy than to be in the presence of the Lord. And that's why she would host these prayer meetings that she would have in her home. One particular prayer meeting involved the recovery of Peter. And as his mother hosted that prayer meeting, you will know a miracle took place in the local jail and Peter was set free and liberated because of that prayer meeting. Now, I want you to know that, young person, you have an opportunity like so many others do not have in the fact that you are in the company of people that realize when you are in jeopardy, they have an awareness that the devil is after you, and they will get off of their couches, they'll get out of their desk chairs, and roll out of bed, and they will get down and pray on your behalf. And so we know that John Mark was certainly someone that had everything that he needed in order to become quite the disciple of the Lord. There's some present in this building will remember, though, there is a blight in the life of John Mark. Because of his blunder, there was a blight. How many of you have ever made mistakes? Is there anybody in this building? 
going through life without making a blunder, without making a mistake. Is there anybody in this building tonight without a blight of some kind on your life? Is there anybody in this building with a black cloud from your past hovering overhead? I'm looking at some imperfect people that have made some mistakes, including this week, but I'm looking at people that do not want to sin habitually. I'm looking at people that treasure the words of Jesus when he mandated and commanded that his followers be perfect, even as his Father in heaven is perfect. I'm looking at people that treasure the scripture that said, ye be holy even as your Father in heaven is holy. And so there's no doubt that John Mark had the upbringing that he needed in order to avoid a lot of the spiritual hardships that so many peers of his would have been experiencing, Brother Richard Jacob. I don't understand why there would be anybody in this building tonight that the Holy Ghost would have to target and say, hey, preacher, preach to them a sermon titled, Don't Miss the Point. So who is it among us tonight under that age of 35 that is missing the point? Perhaps as the preacher is preaching, you will soon realize that you too are missing the point in some way or another. But we know that at some point in John Mark's life, again, the author of this gospel, while he is on a missionary journey with the great apostle Paul, and his companion Barnabas, we find that this young man decides to abort mission, and he abandoned the great Apostle Paul. For me, it seems that Mark was missing the point of the missionary trip that he went on with Paul and Barnabas. I have to say that when I take Brother Nathaniel overseas with me, and we minister in third world countries, there has not been a time that I have felt like Brother Nathaniel exhibited parasitic behavior. There's not been a time that I felt like Brother Nathaniel had done on the vacation mentality. There's not been a time that I noticed that Brother Nathaniel was gazing upon a waterfall or upon the ocean blue. And I realized that his heart was drifted away from our purpose of being there every time that we have been overseas. I have noticed that Brother Nathaniel holds to the purpose of the mission, and that is to reach the least and the lost and the lonely for Jesus. And I can see there is a desire in his heart to teach and preach the word of God. But for some reason, John Mark left Paul and Barnabas during their first missionary trip together. In the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, the beloved position Luke records and he offers some insight into this abandonment. In Acts chapter number 15 and verse number 38, the Bible said, But Paul thought not good to take with him who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. This young man was not willing to go with them to work. Because ministry is work. Fatherhood is work. Pastoral ministry is work. Missionary ministry is work. Motherhood is work. John Mark came with them, but at some point he forsook them. He, like Demas, forsook them for something. I know that the Bible said that Demas forsook them loving the present world. I cannot find this sort of mark against John Mark. I cannot find that he left the company of the Apostle Paul in order to hang out with the wrong crowd in Jerusalem. But for whatever reason, according to the Apostle Paul, John Mark was missing the point of ministry altogether. This young man was nothing more than Barnabas's Barnacle, as I was praying today and seeking the mind of the Lord concerning this sermon and taking it a little bit further as the Spirit of God began to lead me, I thought about the parasitic behavior of this man, John Mark, and how he was content to be nothing more than Barnabas's barnacle. The Bible said that Barnabas took him and they sailed away, and he was okay with that, Brother Jesse. Apparently, he was excited about embarking on the journey initially. He was excited about being in the company of the great apostle Paul and their son of consolation.
Revelation, namely Barnabas. But he was only there for the ride. Does that sound familiar, Sister Wooten? How about it, Sister Howard? Does that sound familiar? Are there young people in this building tonight coming to mind as I begin to unfold what the Holy Ghost rolled up and handed to me? I'm not preaching a blueprint tonight that I drafted with my own hands. I do that for a living, but tonight I'm unrolling a blueprint that the Holy Ghost drew up and handed to me. And I pray that when all is said and done, there's somebody in this building able to say, I see it now. I understand it better than I ever did before. You see Barnabas's barnacle. John Mark was only there for the ride. He was there for all of the wrong reasons. I feel like when he got home, he probably talked about seeing the world. He was looking at things from a different lens. He was looking at things from a different perspective. And you and I both know that the Holy Ghost would not have allowed Barnabas's barnacle, John Mark, to travel with the Apostle Paul and Barnabas for very long with the wrong motives in his heart. There's no way the Holy Ghost would have allowed him to travel another mile. How many of you know you've got to put your heart in it? I've been said that there's been a lot of people listening to this past Sunday's messages. A lot of them have been listening to the joy of Joseph and a lot of them have been listening to Sunday night's message and in Sunday night's message the point was you better not lose heart and you better continue praying. I have noticed that this past Sunday night's message was not most popular with the young people of Bethlehem Holiness Church. Why would that be? Because they do not value prayer. They do not understand the importance of praying things through. They don't understand that life has a bigger meaning than you being on the Sanhedrin or you being an all-star of Judaism. Apostle Paul realized it may be good that it can be said that I know the Torah. I know the law of God. The law of Moses the Pentateuch better than anybody else but I'm missing something we heard brother Jonathan say tonight it's almost been by a year five days short of a year since I got to the Holy Ghost he said I've been missing something and ever since I got the Holy Ghost I can say when I wake up in the morning that my life is better I can say when I get to bed at night, I'm not concerned about my life. If I die, I'm going to be with the Lord. The young person, you get dressed on Sunday morning. You put on your best. Your Sunday best is not good enough. During the week, you put on your best behavior. Your best behavior is not good enough. You've got some good manners. Brother Nathaniel told me today, now he's teaching her his little girl who's learned how to say yes. Now he's teaching her how to be manly. He's teaching her to add sir behind that when she answers Papa. Young person, yes, it's good that John Mark is minding his manners. It's good that he's being mannerly and orderly, but it's not enough. You sitting there spiritually locked right now is not good enough you testify with a mundane tone testify without any passion without any fiber without any fervor without any zeal it is not enough I don't know about you all, but when I was 17 and a half years of age, I got tired of just the mundane church life. I got 
got tired of being this kid on the pew that was not on fire. I got tired of sitting in service after service and missing the point of being there. Your perfect attendance on Sunday morning is grand, but I want you to know what is grander than that is having a real purpose for getting to church. The reason I go to church twice on Sunday and during the midweek is because I don't want to be lost when Jesus comes. It's because he saved my soul and it's a true joy and a pleasure of mine together with a believer. So you might be with Paul, John Mark. You might be with Barnabas, John Mark. But you being Barnabas is Barnacle. It's not enough. You need to realize who you're with. What company you're keeping. And you ought to benefit by it. We should be able to close out right now. There should be enough right now in this sermon for you to get the point of this message. But Paul thought not good to take him with him who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Prayer is work. Praying for our brother's healing is work. Having prayed for our sister's healing is work. Standing for holiness, righteousness, and truth in this secular society, in the midst of this evil and wicked and perverted generation, is work. Why are we doing it? We are not promoting holiness and righteousness simply because we want to be weird or strange or different. We are promoting it and pushing it and preaching it because we feel like Jesus has commanded us to do so and it's a joy of ours in order to do so there's so many people today pastoring churches and preaching to people for all of the wrong reasons one person I'm not missing the point I'm not in this for a picture a parsonage or a paycheck or a position I'm in this to help Jesus. I'm in this to further the gospel. I'm in this because I understand the coming of the Lord in the case that the world has been reached. We've got to reach them for the Lord to come back. The gospel's got to go forth for the return of the Lord to happen. And it is going forth. And it has gone forth. What about a young person? When we start praying, and we start weeping in the spirit, and we start crying, and we realize that we're praying, that we're praying, prayers of intercession and supplication. It's one thing to pray, and it's another thing to intercede and to supplicate. Some of y'all ought to look at those verses of scripture in the New Testament and look at the different types of prayer. I know as a pastor that the Lord uses me sometimes to pray for myself, to pray for my wife, and to pray for my children. I know that he uses me at times because of my office to intercede on the behalf of others. And then I know there are those times when he says, my son, supplicate. You see these men that are in ministry for all of the wrong reasons. They never feel interested at all in meddling in their members' lives. I know that the Bible said concerning that busybody or that unfaithful or unwise person not to meddle in the matters or the affairs of others. But a parent will meddle in the affairs of their children. And so will a spiritual parent, either a pastor or a soul winner. They will check up on things. And they will check up uh, on people uh, before those people uh, check out uh, whether it's out of the parents house uh, or whether it's out uh, of the house of God uh, via death uh, or backsliding 
Somebody will follow up. I'm telling you preachers that are listening to this message, you better be in this for the right reason. Don't you miss the point of ministry. And while you're not missing the point of ministry, whatever you do, do not miss the power. So John Mark said, I'm just going to tag along. Will it be all right if I just tag along? You see, that's the mentality of Judas. There's no doubt he was chosen of the Lord. As one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, he traveled. As one that had power for a little while. Yes, he did. But Brother Nathaniel, he missed the point. I believe that Judas thought that he could hasten the takeover of Rome. You see, Judas understood the Bible. He understood the words of Isaiah and Jeremiah and the prophets of old. He knew that Messiah was coming. He knew that the Jews would take over the world. He knew that Messiah would rule the world. But Judas is traveling with Jesus and somehow he's missing the point. I like what Brother Samuel said when he was preaching this past Friday night. He said, was it uh, that Judas wanted to force uh, Jesus to take action? Uh, maybe it was so, uh, Brother Samuel, uh, that Judas was trying uh, to get Jesus uh, to go ahead uh, and besiege Rome uh, and take over Rome. Uh, but that is not uh, what Jesus intended uh, to do. Uh, at that time, Jesus uh, would not have uh, an earthly kingdom. Uh, at that time, uh, Jesus wanted uh, a spiritual kingdom. He wanted a heavenly kingdom. He did not want to sit on David's throne then. He will one day. But he wanted to sit in the throne rooms of human beings. He wanted them to allow him residence in their heart. Jesus said, you might have missed the point, but the other eleven did not. I pleaded the one the night. You better not I miss the point. It's not that Judas wasn't given every chance that the others were given. He held the bag. He paid Jesus' bills. Jesus and other brothers put in to the offertory, into the offering bags, and Judas paid the bills. And he also took out of the treasury for himself. Judas, Judas, it has been thought for years that you wanted to overtake Rome and that you wanted to sit down beside your Lord as a governor and that you wanted to rule and you wanted to take over and you wanted to bully the Romans the same ways they had bullied you. Judas, it's not enough to be a religious zealot. It's not enough to pull the sword out of the scabbard, Simon Peter, and take the ear off of Malchus. That's what Jesus was telling Peter whenever Judas had betrayed him and those men had come to take Jesus. Jesus was letting Peter know, put up the sword, you're missing the point. It's not time to fight. If I wanted to fight, I would summon the heavens and legions of angels would come down and do our dirty work. They roll off the sleeves and get their hands bloody and dirty with the blood of these Romans. Jesus could have done it, but Jesus was not missing the point. Jesus knew why he was sent here. He was sent on a mission. Paul would not abort and abandon the mission. John Mark would. Judas would, but Jesus would not. How about you? At 65, in this bed of the night, will you miss the point? Will you miss the point? Of the Holy Ghost needing to have his way right now. Of the Holy Ghost needing permission to bring old-fashioned conviction into this church. 
the point of you get truly saved and sanctified and Holy Ghost filled it's not that we can add another preacher to the preacher catalog on the website. It's not so that we can say we've got now 90% of the church spirit bill. And we do. But the reason for it is that you can have great power and great grace and have what you need to keep from backsliding. To have what you need to keep from the lie. The Lord to keep from betraying him. Amen. You're missing it. I'm content to be Barnabas' barnacle. As long as pastor tells me to take the trash out, I'm good. As long as pastor says I'm his little or big helper, I'm good. As long as the Sunday school teacher is handing me the role of attendance book and I'm checking off present or absent, I'm good. Come on, Judas. Are you really good? That you're the treasurer or the secretary. Are you really good? I know we've been blessed with good men here. I'm not preaching to Brother Nathaniel. I'm not preaching to Brother Jesse. But I do feel like I'm preaching to some young men that are not taking things seriously. They're not praying. They're not seeking God. They're not coming right here. No matter how much we ask them to do it. Why would he ask us to do something? There must be a point in it. There must be a reason. What is the reason? Again, this past Sunday night's message was popular among outsiders, but it's not popular amongst people here. Why? Because we don't want to continue to pray. Going over there to fire forward stone schedule is not enough. You can bury your head in the elbow or even in your armpit. And the only thing that it will benefit you is you realize you need to go home and take a bath after a hard day of work if you miss the point of being there. What is the purpose of being there? The Bible said that there would be religious leaders that would stand in a marketplace. They would stand in a public place and they would make long prayers to be heard. They missed the point. I'm telling somebody, I'm not being in the air tonight. I might be sick in body, but I've got the spirit of God on me. And I'm telling you, you better wake up lest you miss the point. Oh, Jesus. Now, how long have we been preaching? Are we at the 27 and a half minute mark? I don't know. I don't have a timepiece in the pulpit or on the back wall. And somebody might say, well, that's the reason why y'all have long services. No. The reason why we have long services is because Bethel Holy Church, they love to get in the spirit and not hold the Holy Ghost to a time clock. I doubt in the upper room anybody was saying what time it was. They were not missing the point. I'm not trying to go to church on Sunday from 10 a.m. until noon and beat other people to the chicken house. The point of me coming to church is to see my wife get help. And to see my children get established. And to see my grandchildren get rooted and grounded. And to preserve myself from this untoward generation. Oh, come on now. When you come to church, you're missing the point. Why are we here? Oh, you're not the Lord of Barnabas's barnacle. Like a wart on the finger. Like a tick on the dog. He had been excited about embarking on this journey with Paul and Barnabas, but he was only there for the wrong reasons. The contention his half-heartedness brought between two wonderful people, namely Paul and Barnabas. Oh, it was great. 
Do you hear me? The contention that this half-hearted worshiper brought between two great men of God is terrible. Husband and wife, have you been having contention in your house because somebody has not been listening to the pastor who ever the wrong doer is? That is where the blame is to be cast. Thank you, Sister Howell. Thank you, Holy Ghost. The person is trying to do right. Let's get in the point. Oh, come on now. You cannot help but appreciate somebody that's not missing the point. Don't you miss the point. Now, I can really elaborate right here. Me telling somebody to get a job and work 40 hours a week. One of the reasons for that is you've got bills to pay. And you've got to provide for your house. But there's so much more to that that we can't miss the point of. We've got children coming behind us that need to develop a good work ethic. They need to realize that this is a dog eat dog world and that the devil devours finances and the devil devours families and the devil devours relationships. Are you kidding me? Oh, come on now. The conflict and the contention between Paul and Barnabas was because of one silly person named John Mark. Are you that silly person? Are you that silly person? That visitor came. The Spirit of God wanted to deal with them. But your pastor had to deal with you. And that person left confused because of the contention that was in the building. Because of you, John Mark, you knew better, John Mark. He was missing the point of ministry. Somehow this man overlooked the most important things involved in ministry. Take Brother Philip's situation, for example. It is true that I do not want to lose a son. But also, to go on, we don't want to lose our drummer. Sister Elizabeth doesn't want to lose her husband. And I thought you don't want to lose a brother. But Sister Cheryl, you can call it stingy, me praying for her to stay here if you want to. But there's another reason for why Sister Cheryl needs to tarry. She's got a husband sitting there next to her on the pew. And that's what Apostle Paul said to the early Christian church. He said, I could depart. It'd be better for me. But it's needful for me to stay here. And that's what I've been telling God. God, you know Sister Howard is needed. God, you know Pastor Howard is needed. I told him, don't take Sister Ruth yet. Don't take Sister Jackie yet. Don't take Sister Gary yet. That's how I prayed last night at 3 in the morning. I said, God, it's needful for them to be here. Are y'all getting this? This thing is so much bigger than us, John Mark, than you say and you spotted a whale out there. This is not a whale sighting expedition. This is not Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn's adventure. This is not David and his mighty men or Jeremy and his mighty men. This is the kingdom of God and it's suffering followers and we need you to take it by force with us. I'm not coming here because it's an opportunity to have a social life. I'm not trying to be a social person. I am friendly. I have friends here. We have wonderful fellowships here. But listen, Barnabas, you're nothing but a teacher to somebody that's not listening. Listen here, Paul. You're nothing but an example to somebody that's not learning. Now, I know the rest of the story goes that when Barnabas got done, John Mark was considered to be profitable by the Apostle Paul. And when I get done tonight, and when we finish allowing the Holy Ghost to write your last chapter, I pray that it will be said, they got it. They got to a hold of it. He was missing the point. Should I keep preaching or stop? 
the most important things about this ministry was that he be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know you come up here to the choir. We don't need you in the choir and out of the choir. You come up here to preach. We don't need you in the pulpit and then out of the pulpit because you've done something that demanded disciplinary action. Oh, come on, John. You're being dismissed. You're being dismissed. The Bible said in the New Testament uh, that the Lord put preachers uh, into the ministry because uh, he counted them uh, faithful. Uh, surely, uh, you notice that the people of God uh, in Scripture uh, and those outside uh, of Scripture uh, have been unwavering. Uh, why did John Mark not take notice uh, and copy our parents uh, the faithfulness uh, of the unwavering spirits uh, of Paul and Barnabas? Why not? Why not? Well, I'm, uh, I'm preaching to you. And the Holy Ghost is having a hard time moving because all of the saints of God in the building know you are missing the point. I want somebody to look at your neighbor and say, Hey, neighbor, there you go. Missing it again. Matthew chapter number 11 and verse number 7 it said, And as they departed, Jesus began to say to them concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind. Again, why did John Mark notice? Did not why did he not notice the steadfastness and the unwavering spirits of Paul and Barnabas? Jesus said concerning John the Baptist, did you go out in the wilderness to see a reed shaken with the wind? He referenced these reeds because of everybody knew John was the baptizer. Hey, they had seen them reeds and the bull rushes down there by the Jordan. They were were shaken. But Jesus said, you false teachers, they might move with every wind of doctrine. But John was rigid back. And I told somebody, I believe it was this past Sunday night, grow a spine. Should I stop preaching or keep preaching? The crickets are preaching better than I'm preaching tonight. And they're preaching louder than I'm preaching and louder than you're saying amen. The spirit of the apostle Paul was steadfast, unmovable, unshakable, unbreakable, unwavering. And so was the spirit of John the Baptist. Jesus was saying, did you expect to see John the Baptist wavering in his faith? No. You knew he wouldn't waver or falter or deviate from a steadfast service to God. It's a true privilege of mine to come into church and see those people that are not up and down, in and out, steadfast, Satan, and not Barnabas and Barnacles. These men, including John, had been on a mission, and they would complete it, not abandon it or abort it. They would not abandon their assignment. If the church was summoned to prayer, they would pray. If the Holy Ghost said, seek me, they would not roll out of bed at 11 o'clock or 2 p.m. and say a 10-second prayer. Oh, come on now. There's a cricket preaching again. Oh, come on now. I'm hearing them preach pretty loud. Why aren't we here tonight? I'm not here tonight to be a parasite. I have not cannibalized anybody's sermons. I have not printed anything off the internet. I have not copycatted anybody. I am here tonight to be sermon specific for the Bethel Holiness Church and as your pastor to preach to you what God told me to preach to you. Again, I'm I'm not here tonight uh, as a parasite. Uh, I'm not here uh, with a name Barnabas uh, Barnacle, uh, and I'm not interested uh, in missing the point uh, of this service. Uh, and I'm not interested uh, in missing the power uh, available within this service. The passages that we read as our golden text, they spoke of a time when the very followers of Jesus Christ, those that were close enough to him to see the beads of perspiration upon his brow, those that were close enough to him when he overturned the tables, 
of the money changers. Somebody said that preacher's countenance changed in a moment. I don't like that. These people could have said, I didn't like the way Jesus' countenance was when he overturned them tables. I didn't like the way his appearance was and his countenance was. Whenever he fashioned that scourge and began to drive people out. And there were people missing the point. They were missing the point of why Jesus was running them out. And so Jesus offered in summary an explanation of why he ran them out. He said this should be a house of prayer. This should not be a place where you're cleaning up manure behind the goats and the sheep and the, the doves. This should not be a place of merchandise. Oh, come on, they could say, well, we're here for the sacrifice. We're here to provide the sacrifice. And Jesus is saying, you're missing the point of gathering. The point of coming to this place was, it's a house of prayer. I've heard Sister Luke say it for years. If you come to the altar or come to church, you ought to mean business. You ought to realize there is a reason why I drive towards it, the front near the altar service is because of what an altar means, what it signifies. Oh, come on, you're missing the point. The disciples were very familiar with Jesus as John Mark would have been Paul and Barnabas. I know what my pastor looks like when he gets anointed. I know what my pastor looks like when he's about to go get something to eat. I can see the various expressional changes on his face. Brother Nathaniel came over to the house today and we visited for about 40 minutes. And after a while, I said, let's go get something to eat. And that may have been the very reason why he came. That might have been the point. It might not have been to come get Papa's utility trailer and to take Papa's mower to wherever Papa wanted him to take it. He came just by surprise, walked in the front door unannounced. And, but I don't know what his point in his visit was, but I was glad he came. But when I come to church, I come to eat. When I come to church, I come to praise the Lord. I don't come just to plop down in a pew and do little. Or do enough to get by. Oh, come on now. If I was a bar room attendant, I would not act the way some church people act in the house of God. I would be nearly as boring as some of you are in the house of God. God has been so good to us this week. Every week up until this week. And he's going to be good to us in the upcoming weeks. And Brother Jesse, I don't just put on a suit to come in here and to preach because it's my position and this is my post. I come in here because I love the Lord and I want to return thanks and I want to serve the Lord. If I'm doing the preaching or if one of these other anointed brothers is preaching, I'm just glad to be in the house of God. If you could get the reason for why we're here and realize there's a point for these altars and that is a point of contact. There is a point to this sermon. There's a point to every song. There's a message to every testimony. There is a theme to every service. The Holy Ghost has a point of showing up. What is the point of us being here if there is no point at all? You're missing the point. These disciples. Jesus began to tell them something. And he began to speak of the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. He was talking about false teachers and false doctrine. And those carnally minded men that should have been with him. And should have learned by now what Jesus meant when he said it. They act confused. Brother Chris Barnett was with me this past Friday night. This past Friday, I mean. While we were on the boat, he spoke concerning one young man. Over here in this corner, he said, is he slow? Is he missing something? Is he misfiring somewhere? He said, but I don't think he's as slow as he tries to make out. Now, Brother Chris isn't one to talk about people at all. And I wouldn't allow him to do that at all. 
But he's visiting enough to notice that I'm nudging in certain areas and budging people in certain areas that he said, I don't really understand why some people don't get a hold of what it is they're supposed to do. And that was probably the first time God started dealing with me along these lines to preach this message. But it was like gasoline to the fire at 3 o'clock this morning and some yesterday and again today that they are acting oblivious to the call of the Holy Ghost. They're acting oblivious to the reason why we go to work. That's what the Bible said. John Mark left them for the work. He didn't want to work. There's a reason why we're getting the Holy Ghost. There's a reason why we're praying the way we're praying. The way we're worshiping, the way we're worshiping. Oh, come on now. I'm asking God to help you right now. Realize that everybody sees it but you. Everybody knows you should be understanding, but you choose not to. You just don't get it, do you? You just don't get it, do you? I feel like Sister Pam Petulio is here tonight because she loves Jesus. I feel like Sister Howell is here tonight because she loves Jesus and Jeremy. But if Brother Jeremy was to die tonight, you'd see her right here Sunday morning. If your circumstances were to change, where would you be come Sunday morning? Brother Dwayne, if she dies tomorrow, where will you be come Sunday morning? Right here in the house of God. He ain't going to miss the point. He, Sister Cheryl would tell him on Judgment Day, Dwayne, the point was, we all got to make it. Daddy and Mama had to make it. I had to make it. And Dwayne, you were supposed to catch the point, understand what was going on, and make it too. As some of you in this building tonight are only here because your spouse wants you to be here. You're in this only because your mom and God is in there, so come on now. I don't care who your mama is, John Mark, you better not miss the message, you better not miss the point, and you better not miss the power. Jesus was with them, Sister Megan. The Son of God was with them. And they're taking what he's saying and looking at it from a different view. Are you taking in everything the Lord is telling you through these preachers and looking at it all from your point of view? Well, from my point of view, I'm doing this. I am working a job 10 hours a week. Well, from my point of view, I see what I'm doing. Well, from my point of view, I'm not where I used to be. That's good. I'm glad you're better off today than you were last year. But my point is, we need to be progressing. My point is, there's a mission. My point is, there's souls to be won. My point is, we need to be a good example. That's my point. Jesus has been good to us, and I want to be good to him. I'm a bit of liberty in my soul tonight. Somebody's been praying during the day, and you're not coming to church praying up. Brother E.J. Wallace said, if you'll frequent five forest as much as he's been frequented, he said, I have learned one lesson for sure. When you pray it through out there and you don't play out there, when you come to church, you walk in the door speaking in tongues, you walk in the door on fire. Oh, come on now. And that's what I'm telling you. That is a reason why we should be listening to preaching as much as we can rather than playing the Xbox. There's a reason why we ought to be praying and worshiping God as much as we can rather than enjoying uh, the pleasures uh, of this life. We might miss the point. I need to close. You just don't get it, do you? Again, are you taking in everything the Lord is telling you through these preachers and looking at it from your point of view? That's good, preacher. That's great. But I got my spin on it. I've got my own glasses that I want to look at it through. I've got my own view. Preacher, you may have the bird's eye view of it, but I'm going to look at it from a different angle, and I'm going to have the worm's eye view of it. It's not 
that these followers of Jesus lacked instruction. Neither do we. We've got some great preachers in this building. We've got some excellent teachers. We've got the anointing of God. We've got highly anointed singers and musicians. Hey, how many of you believe that? And most importantly, we got the word of God. You do not lack instruction. You do not lack example. You do not lack understanding. You just choose to miss the point. And I was praying this afternoon, and the Holy Ghost brought this to my understanding. Even the Ethiopian eunuch, when he was standing out lakeside, he was holding in his hands the sacred scripture. And he was reading the words of prophet, the prophet Isaiah. And he was reading wonderful words. And even then, Brother Caleb, he was wondering and questioning, what is the meaning of this? And because he was sincerely questioning and he did not want to miss the point he wouldn't miss the point if you are missing the point it is because you are not wanting the truth because the bible said a fool though a wayfaring man he will not err you will not miss the point if you're following the leading of the holy ghost you will not miss the point if you're receiving spiritual guidance from jesus this is the biblical example the holy ghost brought to my mind and there is that ethiopian eunuch standing in there and the Holy Ghost uh, translates uh, Philip from one point to another and he begins to ask the eunuch do you understand are you getting a hold of this are you looking at this right and he was because the Holy Ghost pointed this out to me he said the man said here is water what doth hinder me of being baptized sister Howell he just needed a little shove into the water and if you the point of coming to church and you have the right ideology and the right attitude about it. All it would take is a little shot to get in to the presence of the Lord. I said, oh, it would take only a little shot to get into the presence of the Lord. Oh my God, in heaven, somebody better not miss the point. The point in last Sunday night's message was that we, like that widow woman, would continue to pray. And we had tortured interpretation before I preached it that literally prophesied what I would preach on. Yes, I know about it. Yes, I'm involved. Yes, there's divine intervention. But you better pray. Because the point of the church has always been you pray. You praise the Lord. Whether you're in the palace, you pray and you praise the Lord. Whether you're in the prison house, Paul and Silas, you pray and you praise the Lord. The Baptist people might not understand our point, but I'm not putting an emphasis on outward attire only. That is not my point. My point is inward holiness, sanctification, and righteousness. And when you get something working on the inside, you don't miss the point of why we believe in being modest. There's so many people miss the point of why we're doing what we're doing. Why we go to church, it's not the church is a crutch. It's that it's my privilege and my honor to go to church. That's why I was here an hour and ten minutes early tonight. That's why there's hardly ever a time that I will be less than 30 minutes early to church when I was not preaching. Most of the time, the Havel children will remember we were early to church between 30 minutes, but most of the time, an hour before church. I got down and prayed and set an example before these Howell brethren. Brother Roquet did the same thing for Caleb. He wasn't a preacher, but he taught Brother Caleb that being 30 minutes early is being late. Sister Simmons got here the other night 28 minutes early, and somebody I said, Sister Simmons is late. What is the point of coming to church? They come out on time. What is the point of coming to church? Period. It's got to be friendly only. 
Uh, it's not to just be there uh, and suck up the AC. Uh, it's not to give me time uh, and often only. Uh, it is to be uh, in the presence uh, of God. Uh, why should I drive an hour? Uh, why should I drive two hours? Uh, the point is uh, because you know uh, you're dead there. Uh, you feel something there. Uh, and you know you need it there. You're not lacking instruction. The Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch. He knew. He knew. He knew. You know. With our golden text in mind, Mark 8, 21, and he said unto them, how is it that ye do not understand? Brother Jesse, would you come to the piano? These disciples were completely overlooking the spiritual aspect of this situation and were choosing to focus on the natural side of things. And how many of you know the Bible said the carnal mind is enmity against the spirit? Jesus was telling them about beware of the bread of the Pharisees. And immediately they're thinking of loaves of bread. They're thinking of natural things. They're looking at the natural side of things. And that's what people's doing. Oh, we're going to build a new church. Oh, somebody's sitting in my pew. Oh, it's a little bit hot in here. Oh, if that's why you come to church, you're missing the point. Jesus was not telling them you should have brought a sandwich. Jesus was warning them of false doctrine and false teachers. Jesus was warning them about them, ungodly influences of false teachers and false doctrine. And they thought that they were in trouble for bringing, not bringing a sandwich. That's a far cry from what was really going on. The light bulbs are coming on out there. Jesus was warning them of spiritual things, sounding the alarm. False teachers are coming to destroy your congregation. False doctrine's going to get in. And men are going to be carried with every wind, every slot of doctrine. Jesus was being so spiritual and saying, you better be careful of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees and they're looking in little man's lunchbox. They're looking in their lunch baskets. Mark chapter number 8, verse number 19, the Bible said the Lord reminded them of what he did in feeding of 5,000 besides women and children with five loaves, two fishes. There were plenty of fragments left over whether or not Jesus is saying, how many baskets were left over he said how many remnants how many fragments how many leftovers brother Johnny Platt believed it was the bones of the fish believed it was the heels of the bread some people believe it was just an overabundance I don't care how you stand on that if it was just the remnants of the fragments of what was left over if you would the scraps or if you believe it was just an abundance but they had taken 12 baskets supposedly but somebody had laid them baskets down and Brother Starrett, he's talking serious spiritual doctrine here. And they're wondering, we should have brought some bread. Jesus is getting on to us because nobody's got any bread in their lunch baskets. Do y'all realize that, Sister Wooten? Do you realize that there's somebody in this building, no matter how much the Holy Ghost speaks, how much he talks, how much the preacher preaches, how confused visitors get when pastors lay on the line, you continue to look at things from your perspective. Well, from my perspective... I am working a job. From my perspective, I am busy. From my perspective, it, you need to quit thinking about yourself and think about the real picture here. I'm hoping that somebody will fall on their knees and not pray and really pray this through and say, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I really want to see Jesus. I really want to see Jesus. I don't want to miss the glory. I don't want to miss the point of the power. His disciples should have known them going hungry had been an issue today. Sister, why would they ask that? Jesus needed to pay the taxes. He said, cast the barren hook out there. Bring in a fish. They knew what the scripture said. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. Why are they thinking Jesus is thinking there's nothing in the backpack for us to eat? He doesn't need little man's lunchbox to bless his people. He can rain manna upon his children from the sky. Amen. His disciples should have known that he could have called down fresh bread from the portals of glory. Right. It's never been an issue of the child of God for them to pay their bills and to go hungry. Jesus takes care of them. 
Brothers and sisters, we like the disciples have seen the master at work and there is no need for anyone to think much on how he's going to take care of us. He's taking care of us in ways that we know, in ways that we see, in ways that we don't know, and in ways that we don't see. We've been praying for Brother Phillips, Sister Cheryl, Sister Donna, Brother Simon, who's facing a major surgery. But little did we know that little baby Ezra would be born yesterday with the cord wrapped around his neck three times. His daddy said, I unwrapped it one time. Said, whoa, there's another loop. I unwrapped it again. Oh, there's another loop. And I unwrapped it again. What are you talking about, young person? You need to stop well watching. This ain't no cruise. This ain't carnival cruise. This is the old ship of Zion. And I just felt the Holy Ghost said, I'm out of way, Brother E.J. I can tell you feel it. When that new sanctuary goes up out there, it's not going to be all oh, praise God. Look at what we got. I'm just going to see it as a bigger hospital for sinners and saints. Yes. I feel this in my soul right now. When you start realizing the need to be your brother's keeper, to bear your brother's burdens and realize the reason why we're doing, we're doing this is there's a mean devil out there that wants to destroy people's lives. He wants to drag baby Ezra out into a world of sin. That's why I'm here. I'm not here right now because I just enjoy preaching to people. I'm here right now because I know there's a well-worn path around every church and every person. It's a path that the devil has worn. The adversary walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I'm here tonight because I understand the point of me being here. The night I got called to preach, or if you would actually answer the call, the Holy Ghost had convicted me very strongly that I must answer the call this night. That very night I knew that God was dealing with me in my heart in a different way, the same way he's been dealing with me again of late about something. And I told Sister House that I'm walking to church tonight. It was probably only three-quarter mile walk to church. And as I walked, I walked out of my house and I felt a strong spirit of God, the good Holy Ghost, and then I felt a very wicked spirit come by. And when I felt that wicked spirit come by, I heard a rustling in the leaves around the bay tree. And in that leaf pile, there was a squirrel laying there that had been gutted. And there it was with its entrails hanging out. It looked like a lot of steam coming out of its body. And I heard the Holy Ghost say, if you had been here, the little squirrel wouldn't have died. If you would got here just a little bit sooner, he wouldn't have died. And then I felt that evil spirit again. It's no joke when they say Jesus on one shoulder and the devil on the other. That evil spirit said, look to your left. I looked to my left and there was a cat sitting on the top of the fields. I'm not one of these crazy preachers. Hang with me and you'll find out I'm not a crazy preacher. And I'm not talking about anything off the wall right now. I'm talking about something that really happened. And it seemed like that spirit said through that cat, yeah, you came too late. I killed him and there was nothing you could do about it. And what resonated and echoed in my soul was, you came too late. You came too late. To cut the time of this message short, there was a man named Robert Hammond down here and his bride, Frances Gale, their daughter, Jennifer. A man named Johnny Platt and his wife, Barbara Platt. There was a man named Gene Wooten and his wife Iris. There was a single woman named Jackie Walker. Sister Wooten, as great of a woman of God as she is, she tells me often, I don't even know if I'd still be saved if you hadn't come. Brother Platt told me, even on his deathbed, yet again, he said, Pastor, we were falling away, but you came looking for us. It scares me, Sister How, to think how close I was to missing the point. The souls. 
When I look at Grace Starrett, there was a point in us being here. When we feel like we can be unfaithful to church and church attendance doesn't mean anything and we can have a nonchalant attitude, I'm telling you, I feel the sweet spirit of God in this place tonight. Brothers and sisters, we like the disciples. We've seen the master at work. I saw him that night. He touched Brother Jacob in a great way. What he's done for Brother Jacob, he'll do for you. He'll take care of us. Let's stand tonight. He was teaching them of the dangers of false teachings and teachers, and they are looking to see what they're going to do about lunch. Don't miss the point. And don't miss the power. And you're going to miss the point if you come over here and you pray for five minutes and you're done. You will literally stamp your own letter that will be addressed to God and will be mailed to heaven tonight. God, I missed the point. John Mark, what did you see when you set sail? What did you see? Yes, yeah, true, you took Barnabas with you. But you hurt Barnabas, and you hurt Paul. There's some falling in these altars right now. I know God dealt with me concerning this message. Sister Wooten, there's been young men married for the wrong reasons. There's been young women married for the wrong reasons. They didn't understand the real point behind it. So you're going to be a grandma, huh? You're going to be a grandpa, huh? Don't miss the point. Don't miss the power. I don't want to get to the end of my life and find that I have missed the point of my life. That's what Apostle Paul realized. One of our co-texts was Philippians 3, 7 through 11. Apostle Paul didn't get to the end of his life and miss his point. Judas, you missed the point. The good news is John Mark at some point, he got it. He understood. He realized. But Paul wrote these words. Bring John Mark to me. I believe he'll be good. He'll be profitable. Young person, I want you to pray right now and say, God, take me from my unprofitability. Give me profitability for the service. Open my eyes, Lord. Sing it, church. Sing it. May your eyes be open. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. Can you see it? We don't put an emphasis on that outward only because we want to be different. You missed the point. We're trying to please the Lord. Don't miss the point. We're not talking about bread here. We're talking about false doctrine. We're trying to protect you from false teachers, bad influences spiritual, not him, brothers and fathers. Open my eyes, Jesus. Open my understanding, Jesus. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Everybody just ask you to open your eyes. See you high lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Oh, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. 
Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Why are you teaching? 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 Why are you